Welcome. Uh, good evening. Um, this is as large a, a crowd as I think we've ever had uh, in the roughly 15 years of this Cuisine and Culture series. Um, and there are at least two good reasons for that. Uh, foremost, uh, an extraordinarily distinguished speaker, Professor Paul Friedman of Yale, of whom I'll say more in a moment, but also his subject, which is the rise and fall of uh, French cuisine in the United States. Um, and I've noticed that a very large percentage of the people uh, here are roughly in my age cohort, which means they, uh, they married and had children in the late 50s and during the 60s, and uh, they cooked out of mastering the art of French cooking, by and they watched Julia Child on TV right after their kids were finished seeing Sesame Street. Um, and they saved up uh, for birthday and anniversary really special celebrations so they could eat at La Panetiere, Le Becfin, the Café Chauvron, Chambord, uh, Caravelle, La Côte Basque, and if it was really a super celebration, Lutece or Le Pavillon. Um, so uh, I think all of what I'm calling us are very excited by this subject. Uh, Professor uh, Friedman, um, though a scholar of culinary history, um, um, his scholarship uh, in history has a broad sweep. Uh, he is the Chester D. Tripp Professor of History at Yale. He's chaired the department. He's served as director of, the, of undergraduate studies in history. He's an expert on medieval Catalan and Spanish history and has many articles and books uh, that have been published on that subject. Um, he edited Food, the History of Taste, um, wrote a marvelous book, Out of the East, Spices and the Medieval Imagination. Um, and the next book I understand he will be uh, publishing is entitled Ten Restaurants That Changed America. So I think we have reason to invite him back for at least three more <laughs> presentations. We'll space them out, but uh, we'll invite him back. Um, we, we uh, and I should add that he was a member of the School of Historical Studies here at the Institute from 1986 to 1987, so he's coming home. Uh, before I invite him up to the podium, I wanted to offer a third reason that uh, I think so many of us came this evening, which is that his title reminded us that right over there uh, on Wednesday and Friday evenings when the white tablecloths come out, um, we have what may be, probably is, the best French restaurant in New Jersey, maybe the best restaurant in New Jersey. And uh, though it may just be uh, one of the last bastions of a dying tradition, uh, we do, some of us like to think that it's one of a number of launching pads for a revival. And that, uh, so next decade, when Professor Friedman speaks on this subject, uh, some of us are hoping the title will be The Rise, Fall, and Rise Again of French Cuisine in America. So, please welcome <laughs> Professor Paul Friedman. Thank you for such a kind and flattering introduction. Uh, I'm going to talk more about decline than rise, because it's, it's I think, more of a mystery. Uh, and um, my other gloss to uh, the introduction is the Café Chambord. I remember as a child my father coming back from a meal there and telling my mother with incredulity that a cup of coffee cost 50 cents at the Café Chambord. <laughs> Actually, I do want to begin with another uh, story that involves my father, who, uh, whose 90th birthday was in 2007. And my father loved Omar à l'Américaine, this lobster dish uh, that I'm sure many of you know. Uh, 
Some people believe that it's Omar Alamorican uh, from Brittany. Um, this is uh, not true. Uh, it's Omar Alamorican because it has tomatoes in it and um, it, it is uh, it, almost unfindable today in the United States. Not easy to find even in France, I should think. But um, we used to go to a restaurant called Mont Paris in the, I think, uh, East 20s or 30s near where my mother worked. And um, that's what my father had all the time. So for his 90th birthday, trying to find a restaurant in New York that had this dish. And um, I had thought of making a contest of it to see who could come up with the name of one of the few surviving restaurants uh, that could do this. But um, I never was good at that sort of game. It's Le Perigord on, uh, uh, I think, 59th and uh, 1st. So I'm not the first person to have written about, I mean, you know, the, the learned tradition is to go through a survey of the literature. Um, I'm not the first person to have written about uh, or thought about the decline of French cuisine. There is a book called Au Revoir to All That by Michael Steinberger. It, its subtitle is Food, Wine, and the End of France. <laughs> And it's too melodramatic, as the subtitle <laughs> indicates. It attributes the decline of French gastronomy's reputation to the malaise of France, mm -hmm. overregulation, bureaucracy, economic decline. But that really won't do. Not only is it not clear that France's economy is so malfunctioning, but Italy has all of these problems and many more, and yet its food reputation is flourishing. But I'm only really secondarily interested in what has been happening in France. My subject is the decline of French cuisine in America, a chapter of the dossier on the waning of France's international gastronomic hegemony. In the 1964 edition of Craig Claiborne's New York Times Guide to Dining Out in New York, there were eight three-star restaurants. Only the Coach House, and since we're talking about a generation that remembers places like that, only the Coach House had three stars and was the only American restaurant that so described itself in New York. And not only the top restaurants. There were dozens of French restaurants at every level. Modest neighborhood haunts, such as Mont Paris, where we used to go, or Brittany du Soir, uh, or the Café Brittany on the west side near the French line. Modestly elegant places like Le Perigord. Of this uh, dozens uh, of places, there are literally only a handful of survivors. In an era in which the number of restaurants in New York has gone up exponentially, in which the number of types of cuisines, people now distinguishing between uh, obscure provinces of China, or obscure provinces of Italy for that matter, uh, French cuisine, apart from bistros and sort of quick uh, moule frite kinds of places, um, is, is in decline. And this decline is not, in my opinion, just a question of a fashion change, and I think this is why it has historical interest. The long-term hegemony of French cuisine is really truly long-term. It certainly is a phenomenon of modernity. It starts in the 17th or at the latest early 18th century. It can be argued that it perhaps starts as early as the 14th century with the career of Taillevant, the author of the largest selling, or at least most prominent, medieval cookbook. I'll come back to the sort of background of the French culinary hegemony, but I'd like to set it in um, a kind of context uh, from the era when the Café Chambord or um, the uh, La Caravelle or Le Pavillon were uh, distinguished. The first is from 1969, um, and the second is from 1975. In 1969, an issue of Holiday Magazine featured the question, what is the greatest restaurant in the world? And they asked Henri Go and Christian Millot to mull over this question. Go and Millot would go on to be very famous for their guidebook to French dining. 
They would also become famous as advocates of nouvelle cuisine, which was not quite launched in 1969, but within two years would be. But in 1969, they they assume in this article, published in an American magazine, that the only really serious cuisine in the world is French. They acknowledge their preconceptions up front and respond to any anticipated criticism, tant pis. And they then proceed to eliminate most of the world from further consideration. The Soviet Union and China had deliberately wiped out whatever possibilities and culinary traditions they had. In fact, according to Go, the best Chinese food is not to be found in Hong Kong or Singapore, but in San Francisco. Uh, he loved the Imperial Palace. The Middle East, save Francophile Lebanon, is a wasteland. Latin America and Eastern Europe are, quote, gastronomically underprivileged. <laughs> Africa is a total loss except for Dakar in Senegal uh, and Marrakesh in Morocco. As for the Anglo-Saxon world, it suffers from a surfeit of pretentious and inauthentic international cuisine. But Go asks me, yo, aren't there some good, even great restaurants in London, Montreal, New York? I said, of course, but the chefs are all French. <laughs> Once safely in Europe, they're a little happier, but they're still contemptuous about the food of Spain and Portugal, ordinary and heavy. And they disagree about Italy, interestingly enough. Go complains, I don't have a single exciting memory except for the scampi at Harry's Bar in Venice. <laughs> Mio, however, defends at least a few restaurants. The Dodici Apostoli in Verona, Sabatini's in Florence, and Giannino in Milan. Danish food is of good quality, Mio remarks, and quote, children like it very much, unquote. <laughs> Belgium is full of honorable but not quite top restaurants. In Switzerland, they cook in the French manner, adequately but without spark. And so now, really relieved, they turn to France. And they then discuss 25 restaurants. The rest of the world has maybe three that are merit any discussion. The 25 restaurants include the usual Parisian suspects, uh, Tour d'Argent, Grand Vafour, Le Cacarton, but also Chez Denis, whose owner they deem mad for his utter disregard of expense, $20 per person, and lofty indifference to his customers' misguided preferences. The duck must be served bloody or not at all. The final competition comes down to two restaurants near Lyon, which interestingly enough are, are both still uh, survive in some fashion, Bocuse and Trois Gros. So um, they, 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 they decide that both of them are winners. Troigro is more traditional. The brothers who owned it at the time were working for the sake of art, whereas Paul Bocuse is more of an innovator. He's working for fame. One represents wisdom, the other glory. They're complementary. We know the path that would be followed. That would be the Bocuse path, obviously. He is the first modern celebrity chef. However arrogant about dismissing the rest of the world, however overconfident in assuming the preeminence of France, uh, the, um, the, the critics embody an opinion that is not just happens to be the opinion of 1969, but the opinion of 1869, of 1769. French restaurants, French cuisine, France uh, is the um, capital, the tastemaker in a literal sense of the world. The second vignette, just briefly, uh, Craig Claiborne and Pierre Freyne's Miel at Chez Denis, the madman mentioned by Go and Mio. This was in 1975. American Express had a uh, donation to the Channel 13 in New York, which was generous but perhaps naive. They offered a free meal anywhere in the world for two. And Claiborne bid $500, $300. 
and forgot all about it because he expected some high roller to pay in the thousands. Amazingly, he won. Anywhere in the world, they had said. The sky's the limit, they had said. Probably they uh, regretted this. Chez Denis was small but ruinously expensive. Its clientele included Jacqueline Kennedy, Onassis, Orson Welles, assorted millionaires when millionaire meant something, titled heads, <laughs> government ministers, um, Claiborne, uh, and Freyney. Uh, started with uh, Beluga caviar, then three soups, wild duck consommé, uh, germini soup, and velouté andalou. Uh, then seafood, oysters, lobster, and red mullet. Then uh, partridge, chicken, filet de boeuf, Olga Palinkas, a dish beloved by Orson Welles. And that, that concluded the first service. <laughs> My secret is small portions, said Claiborne. An entr'acte of sorbets, orange, lemon, and black currant, uh, preceded a second service, ortolan these tiny grilled birds eaten whole, followed by wild duck, loin of veal with whole truffles, puree of artichoke hearts, uh, pomme de terre, Anna. Uh, then fresh wild duck foie gras, cold wood cock fillets cooked in chambertin, wild pheasant with nuts, mushrooms, and more truffles. And this was the end of the second service. And then the third service was um, pastries, candies, preserves, fruit. There were, there were 33 dishes served in all. It took four and a half hours. Denis uh, uh, said of the food, it's really just things to go with wine. And indeed, the wines are very, very impressive. I won't, I won't bore you with <laughs> the Latour 1918. I, I won't even go into the Mont Rocher. Um, 1969, the Lafitte Rothschild 47, the Petrus 1961, the Romanet Conti 19. Okay, you get the idea. The cost was about $4,000, which would be about $17,000 now. And while impressive, I, you know, you could not get that for $17,000. You couldn't get anything near this. But this is the last gasp of not of French luxury cuisine, but of American adoration of it. Um, Claiborne received a lot of adverse publicity for this stunt that he had not expected. Scorn for the excess, and the scorn is not exactly on moral or financial grounds. Certainly, self-indulgence plays into it, expense plays into it. 1975 was not a great year in the American uh, economy, but it's really that it's so vieux jeu to try to see how extravagant a meal you could order in France. Uh, it has a kind of, um, we don't really do that anymore. It's, you know, it's like wearing a, a, a Nehru jacket or something like that. <laughs> and it's the end of a very long tradition of adoration of France in America. The invention of the restaurant in its modern form took place in Paris shortly before the revolution. The first restaurant in America, and, and I can uh, you know, tell you what I think restaurant means as opposed to inns or chop houses, but the first real restaurant in America was Delmonico's, a French restaurant established in the 1830s, and it was the most acclaimed and uh, most imitated model for restaurants in America throughout the 19th century. The prestige of French culinary taste was established everywhere in the 19th and most of the 20th century. The fanciest restaurant in Mexico City in the, this period was the Maison Doré. The Hermitage was the leading restaurant in Moscow. The Union Hotel served the best, of course, French food in Melbourne. I and mean, one can go on and on with every city of the world. At the 1861 coronation dinner for King Wilhelm I of Prussia, the menu was entirely in French, and it includes poulard de main à la Toulouse, tambal à la Talleyrand, and foie gras en Bellevue. Or a meal served in 1910 at the Grand Hôtel des Andes in Batavia, now Jakarta, 
Indonesia, reveals no concession to the cuisine or climate of Java. Consume Momorasi, filet de boeuf garni a la chatel. Can you imagine eating this in Indonesia? <laughs> filet de sol a l'amiral, escalope de riz de veau a la ville roi, sweetbreads a la ville roi. Another distant homage to the prestige of French cuisine comes from Tombstone, Arizona in the 1880s, when silver mining created overnight a boom town. The hotels and restaurants of Tombstone vied to offer the dishes the same as Delmonico's, or the same as Paris, though with less confident mastery of the French language. <laughs> so we get chicken saute a la marengo with white wine and mushrooms, Ville fricando au midair, which I think is with Madeira sauce. Sliced veal braised or fried with Madeira sauce. Beef a la mode, which is very standard, beef which is larded and braised. Apple fritters with wine sauce. Uh, a place called the Occidental Chop House featured salmi of duck with olives. Fricando of veal with vegetables and then the menu starts to get out of control. Glass croquettes de voival au asparagus point. <laughs> Vol au bent or bont au vent. Um, de fritter a la Maryland. <laughs> a vol a, a vol is a pastry shell. A fritter is a fried item a la Maryland. I don't know exactly what that means in this context. But there's no doubt who's setting the standard, the high-end standard for the world and the United States, however ludicrous some of the manifestations of the supremacy might be. And this is not just a phenomenon of the 19th century. Le Pavillon, of course, um, was established in the seemingly inauspicious year 1941, universally regarded as the leading restaurant in New York until the late 60s. In 2013, by contrast, the San Pellegrino ranking of top restaurants of the world has not a single French restaurant in the top 10. El Sole de Can Roca is number one in Catalonia. Noma in Denmark is number two. Osteria Franciscana in Modena, about which Jane Kramer recently wrote in uh, The New Yorker. Mugarets in the Basque country of Spain. 11 Madison Park, the only American entry. Uh, D.O.M. in Sao Paulo, dinner by Heston Blumenthal, Arzac, a third one in Spain, Steirerecke in Vienna, and Vendôme in Bergisch Gladbach in Germany. The top-ranked restaurant in France is Arpege, which is a vegetarian restaurant. <laughs> the beginning of the end came, as in a way it did in the Soviet Union, with an effort at reform, Nouvelle Cuisine, a movement of the 1970s. And so it's ironic that um, the rediscovery or efforts to reform French cuisine should have uh, been responsible to some extent for the end of its global power. In um, Steinberger's book, Steinberger thinks that this was a missed opportunity, that Nouvelle Cuisine, had it been successful or had they kept on it, would have displaced the Catalan and Basque vanguardia that displaced France initially in the 1990s. Um, I, I actually think Nouvelle Cuisine was a failed reform that couldn't work. A fateful change that far from rebuilding showed the weakness of the established order. This was not the first Nouvelle Cuisine in French history. It had a predecessor in the 1740s with which Rousseau was associated. Um, and indeed, French cuisine's strength has been periodic reforms that rediscover the primacy of the ingredients, the importance of quality, and that try to get rid of the ornamentation and elaboration that can mask or make up for inadequate primary ingredients. Go and Mio were eloquent on les horreurs de la cuisine, the old sauces, you know, sitting on the stove for days to which scraps were added, the lack of freshness or distinction, the reliance on formula. 
They emphasized, you know, their examples of bad food sound like uh, the same things that went on in the United States in the 1970s. Coco van made with industrial chicken and sub burgundy wine. Tornado Rossini, lobster thermidor, heavy and complicated, mustardized bechamel sauces, uh, poor quality or even fake snails in which the garlic butter hides the ingredients. Um, they're scolds, and they're certainly right. The, the abuse of frozen ingredients, uh, the um, use of farmed ingredients. To some extent, it reads like a locavore or a um, uh, seasonal manifesto. But it's also a, um, an example of the Japanese influence on modern food, which is perhaps the most important. Beauty, simplicity, color, uh, and high price. <laughs> they actually had um, a, a number of sort of points in their manifesto. Lightness rather than richness. So do away with rich sauces that have murdered so many livers and concealed so much tasteless flesh. Reduced cooking time. Abolition of ragouts and other sauces based on thick things like flour. Small portions on large plates. Great attention to ingredients. And so like the 17th, 18th century reforms, simple but not cheap. A small menu. Admission of Asian influences. Aesthetic, as I said in Japanese terms, as well as gastronomic. The most important innovation is the chef as creative auteur not as guardian of tradition. Now, many of these, as I said, are reforms that have been incorporated into changes in global cuisine, and particularly dramatic changes in American cuisine uh, via places like Chez Panisse, founded in 1971. But many of these could be easily abused. You get the sort of Asian influence or the uh, emphasis on ingredients, you get odd combinations that Nouvelle Cuisine became famous for. Vanilla flavored sweetbreads, maple syrup on everything, <laughs> chanterelles with pumpkin sauce, star anise and ravioli in a pot au feu. Uh, these are all real examples. <laughs> Nouvelle Cuisine of the 1970s had two sides which have actually since gone separate ways. Primary ingredients simply prepared which has had a tremendous impact on the American rediscovery of local and seasonal food. The other is a paradoxical new complexity that results from breaking with tradition. All culinary movements of simplification become transformed into culinary movements of complexity, partly at the instigation of chefs who get bored, and partly because of this notion of the chef as creator. Once you separate chefs from the sort of artisan idea that they are reproducing as best as possible a tradition and make them creative geniuses, then you have created something that is not in the control of any one nation or any one gastronomic tradition. And that's certainly part of what has happened to French uh, power in this area. So the second tendency, in addition to that of local seasonal food, primacy of ingredients, is what is sometimes called molecular gastronomy at its most avant-garde wing, but it also includes things like Asian fusion or fusion cuisine generally, um, new textures, transformation of ingredients, new ingredients. The, um, the visible aspects of France's decline, besides things like the rankings, are um, the triumph of Spain. There's an article in the New York Times in 2004 at the height of Ferran Adria's El Bouilly, uh, where the author just um, assumes that France is, quote, tired. I think he has an excessively, you know, this year we're doing this kind of fashion orientation. It's like handbags are big, now handbags are small. 
I think, though, there, is, there are several things going on, and, and, and I don't have a single key to this, and it's typical of historians that they like multiple rather than elegant explanations. Um, for the decline of French cuisine in the United States, the, I already mentioned the breakdown of boundaries and the lack of rules. Not who has the best canals or who makes the best duck a l'orange, dishes with which one is familiar, but the inventiveness on the high end. And that includes things I've never had before. Oh, I never had these weird berries and seaweed uh, that I had at Noma. It tasted like nothing else I'd ever had. But also, elevating burgers or pizza to iconic status. There's a high end and a low end, or the obliteration of the difference between high end and low end. The um, falling off of taste for richness, for butter, cream, in particular. The chef as artist rather than master craftsman also means that chefs are not trained but are simply gifted, and the rise of self-trained chefs. The love of variety over um, standard, uh, standards or rules. So America has always been, or at least for 150 years, has been distinguished by variety, if not by intrinsic quality. Immigration, ethnic restaurants, uh, New York as the culinary capital, as the largest city, and as the largest recipient of immigrants have uh, forwarded this. This is not new, but the, um, the blurring of the boundaries and the end of French hegemony has allowed other cuisines and stars like you know, David Chang. Is his cuisine Korean? Is his cuisine David Chang's cuisine? It's certainly Asian inspired. I would also say the real culprit in this, if there has to be a rival cuisine, is Italy. Italy, because it moves from ample low end, what now is dismissed as red sauce, Chianti bottle with a candle in it, restaurants, to high end. And this is a very hard thing to do. Chinese cuisine, which we all acknowledge, has a tremendously elegant uh, tradition. It's very, very hard for Chinese restaurants to charge more than a rather low price and, and to get non-Chinese people to go to them. Whereas Italy has been able to keep a repertoire of neighborhood Italian foods, pizzerias and the like, and to have the kinds of places where for $150 supplement, they'll grate fresh truffles on your um, dish right now, even as we speak, since it's the season. And you can see this in the history of Chez Panisse. And I want to end with uh, Chez Panisse, because it is both the it is in my little list of 10 restaurants that changed America. And, and people in the food world will doubt some of the other choices, but nobody doubts Chez Panisse. Sure, there were French restaurants before. It has a French name. But it goes from being a French restaurant that emphasizes the primacy of ingredients, that emphasizes local cuisine in terms of suppliers and farmers, uh, to something that is called California cuisine, although Alice Waters herself does not like the term. Alice Waters herself says the restaurant is exactly the way it was in 1971, except it's more Italian. I don't think that's true. I think there is such a thing as California cuisine. I don't think the restaurant is that Italian. But you can see the change if you look at their menus from the late 70s and the early 80s. The two influences that come in to undermine a kind of canals and coco van, um, cassoulet, um, choucroute, uh, lobster American style, are Provencal food and Italian food. So this is a restaurant that had n almost no pasta until the 1980s. The Provencal and the Italian influence mean rather simple kinds of cooking, grilling, marinating and grilling, uh, just marinating. 
an emphasis on the primary ingredients, more vegetables, fewer sauces, lighter sauces, all of the kinds of things that have uh, been incorporated into what's called do American cuisine. The medium, it seems to me, actually is Italian, and that's one reason why Italian food uh, has taken up a lot of the high-end room that was once occupied by French food. Finally, I guess two things. One is, I think this is an interesting subject as, of course, the history of cuisine, but also the history of culture and the perception of class and of elegance. And that's really what got me interested in food, is what do upper class people eat? What do lower class people eat? And even more important, what do upper and lower class people think that the other classes eat? What foods are endowed with prestige? And of course, when I started teaching at Vanderbilt in 1979, the despised cuisine was that of people like those who lived in Appalachia, who grew their own fruits and vegetables, canned them, had chickens in their backyard. And now those same people are condemned for eating processed foods and the well-off have chickens in their backyard <laughs> and shop at farmer's markets. Uh, the other thing I wanted to remark is really what I should have said at the opening. Uh, I was at uh, the Institute as a member in 1986, 1989. I cannot express how much of a difference it made to my career, to my intellectual formation, and the presence of Giles and uh, Pat Constable, uh, pa Giles Constable and Pat Wolf uh, uh, make me even more conscious of the debt that I owe to the Institute and the pleasure I take at being here. Thank you very much. I would be glad to, to respond to questions. Uh, we have the microphone here. Uh, to what extent do you think changes in attitudes about um, health, um, particularly heart health, um, led to uh, people fleeing French cuisine? I think, as I said, the, the sense that French cuisine is rich and uh, is certainly part of it. I don't think that it is unhealthful or that what people do, I mean, I think that a lot of perceptions of healthful and unhealthful are inaccurate. So fish is regarded as healthful and light, uh, but I think it probably is uh, you know, more dangerous than many other kinds of food uh, because of pollution. So uh, yes, of course, but I think that that's a question of um, uh, uh, image, and it's, it's certainly an American preoccupation that is spreading to the rest of the world, but is, is, is stronger in America. Uh, might you comment upon the uh, popularity or lack thereof of uh, French bistro and brasserie cuisine as opposed to the four and a half hour, $17,000 right. high-end extravaganzas? Right. Right, so uh, bistros and brasseries are, there certainly are plenty of them. And so steak frites, moule frites, uh, quiche lorraine, uh, they all have pasta in their American incarnation. Uh, they are a kind of, um, I, I, you know, and I, I like them a lot. But you know, I have, a, I have some friends in Pelham where I live who opened a restaurant called Bistro Roland five years ago, and they now wish they didn't have a French name, even the, even the bistro, uh, that this perception of French food as expensive, as old-fashioned, as maybe not uh, healthful. Uh, if you look at their menu, it's full of now sort of American and local food, a lot of Italian things, you know, bistro Roland burger. Uh, so I think that these, these are bistros all right, and they have some French dishes but they're, they're succeeding by taking advantage of the coolness remaining in French culture and uh, getting rid of most of the culinary parts of it. Uh, because of your obviously very educated uh, interest in food, what would you say is the most 
popular cuisine in the U.S., and thereafter, what would you say is the best restaurant for that cuisine? Hmm. Hmm. I think Italian uh, or Chinese. In, and uh, within a more narrow circumscription, a kind of cuisine that might go under the name of Brooklyn uh, or Bay Area. So uh, Italian, for reasons that I uh, have mentioned, I, am, I don't actually live in New Haven, but I will say that the New Haven pizzerias are still, still the best. Uh, and um, uh, at the high end, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to choose. Uh, I think I'll, I'll punt on that one. Uh, or solicit your opinions. Uh, <laughs> And then the third, New American, or, or sort of Brooklyn. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, here too, it's kind of uh, it's kind of hard. French Laundry, pretty obvious. Uh, Alinea in the sort of molecular category, which I don't think is going to endure, but nevertheless, in Chicago, this is a splendid example of high-end restaurants uh, of international quality. Yeah. I would just like to recommend a low-end restaurant in New York City. It's a French bistro, no pasta, absolutely fabulous, low-priced wines, Chez Napoleon on 50th Street. It is a really old-fashioned bistro. The family's been there for 50 years. It's just and the great. name? Chez Napoleon. Chez Napoleon, yeah. Well, Chez Napoleon is one of those survivals, certainly, that I have mentioned. And it's more than a, I would say it's even more than a bistro. It's informal, but it is a real restaurant. Yeah. I don't quite understand the criteria of the critics, the American critics you're citing, because the dishes mentioned are all of them anything but haute cuisine. Coco vin, a boeuf à la mode. Uh, th this, is, this is bourgeois cuisine. This is not what any great chef would consider offering if he's offering haute cuisine. So th there's something wrong with, with the, the standards. Well, OK. There are two movements that one is the late 19th century discovery within France of provincial cuisine. So suddenly dishes supplement the haute cuisine traditions. As late as the Time Life cookbooks, you may remember there is a, a volume of haute cuisine of what are already in 1971 um, unreproducible at home dishes, you know, that take four days or that, you know, begin with making glace de viande out of uh, whole animals. <laughs> and then a cooking of provincial France. Uh, but the, and so if you look at 19th century American menus like that of Delmonico's, they have no coco van, they have no cassoulet, they have no choucroute, uh, absolutely not. Uh, they have lots of things in champagne sauce or, uh, um, uh, you know, um, things uh, with a la soubise or richelieu or, um, uh, and these are the repertoire of uh, classic French cuisine. But. If you look at the menu of Le Pavillon, it's a kind of combination. And uh, uh, Soule would introduce a certain number of uh, what he regarded as uh, uh, the uh, treasures particularly of the South. So you're quite right, but it is, uh, it, it is partly a question of the steps of a transformation of what haute cuisine at one time was. Indeed, indeed. But the, the movements that get most attention are things like these very little restaurants that have a tiny staff. Um, there's, a, there's a name, these sort of economical restaurants uh, and uh, more artisanal restaurants. And unfortunately, the grand tradition, uh, the tour d'argent kind of uh, tradition, well, it, it has an international tourist wealthy tourist, uh, expensive, but right. But even Taiwan, let's say. Taiwan was classic. 
Right. 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 And they still are guarding the tradition. I'm, I'm not saying that the flame is out. I'm just saying that that's a guttering. Indeed, indeed, I totally agree. I, I don't think it's justified. I'm just telling you a phenomenon about the United States. When I was growing up in New York City, there was a uh, Eastern European Jewish style delicatessen practically in every corner, and now I don't think there are more than four. Right. What do you attribute this terrible loss? To? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think what I'm trying to point out is that in an era in which we celebrate the diversity and you know people are food crazy, there are many wonderful cuisines that have either disappeared or are near to disappearing. Um, in the case of uh, Jewish delicatessens, part of it has to do with the uh, idea that the food is not healthy, again. Part of it has to do with the... Um, children not going into the occupations of their parents. Some of it has to do with the same reason why Koreans don't run fruit markets uh, anymore in New York. The, the, the new generation aspires to something different. There is a movement to uh, save this. Uh, there's a book called Save the Deli, actually, and then there's a, uh, an autobiography by the guy who runs Russ and Daughters, who got a law degree, uh, but then who went back into the family business. Russ and Daughters uh, uh, store on uh, Houston. So uh, I, I'm glad you raised that point because it shows that there are a number of different traditions. German cuisine, uh, uh, at one time common in uh, the United States. In fact, arguably the first so called ethnic cuisine as far back as the mid 19th century. Um, there are even fewer German restaurants than classic French restaurants in New York. So yeah, there, there, are, there are a number of these. They all do share an image of um, you know, high fat, high richness. But there are other paradoxes. For example, there must be 10 times as many Filipinos immigrants to New York as Thai. Yet there are like two Filipino restaurants in New York City that, that, that anybody who is not Filipino knows about. And, and how many Thai restaurants or restaurants claiming to be Thai? Why is that? Perhaps this is an unfair question to ask a historian, but uh, would you be willing to project or take some speculation about 20 years from now or 50 years from now what the cuisine of choice would be? Yeah, I think a lot has to do, will depend on ecology and uh, the future of the food supply. One of the things that is the most striking looking at 19th century American menus is the number of prestige dishes that now could not be reproduced because the species is either gone or, or threatened. The two most prestigious dishes, three most prestigious dishes in the United States in the 19th century are oysters, which have a fighting chance of coming back, canvasback ducks, and terrapin. And the two latter are, you know, hard or impossible to procure. Uh, so a lot's going to depend on whether the oceans still have fish, for example. Um, having said that, it's always hard not to be enamored of the trends that are taking place now. I think that the change towards seasonality and respect for local ingredients or respect for the ingredients and quality is the most dramatic change because it goes against American tradition. American tradition in food has been to emphasize variety rather than quality. You have 40 kinds of ice cream. It's not all that great, but it does come in 40 different kinds. <laughs> the reason that it's not all that great is because it's very hard to do on an industrial level. Industrial production of stuff like orange juice or ice cream or soup or uh, anything, pastries, uh, the yogurts, the, the producers offer you uh, a, a lot of distractions so that you won't actually look at the or experience the, the basic quality. Anything that goes against that um, really revolutionizes American taste and the extent to which it is not just an elite phenomenon but one where 
and I would argue that it's not strictly elite. I think you can see this in the rise of farmers markets, in the percentage of organic food that is sold in the US, and in things like, you know, places like Columbus, Ohio have wonderful restaurants. Uh, whereas before it would have been this sort of Casa de la Maison house uh, environment that, that, that Calvin, Calvin Trillin memorably, so-called continental food. I wanted to ask you about the French at home today and has there been a parallel decline? Um, I was junior year abroad in 1960 and lived with a bourgeois family on the Boulevard de Raspail in Paris. And they would start preparing a Sunday lunch on Saturday um, in bourgeois homes where the cooking was superb. I mean, the mothers shopped every day in the, in the markets. Um, but Sunday was haute cuisine. The, the meals were quite elaborate. And I wonder, does that still go on in France today? Has there been a decline in, in the cooking in the home? I think if you measure it against 1960, yes, uh, because people for the same reasons uh, as here. They don't have as much time together. They don't have as much time, period. Uh, they don't regard um, spending time cooking as necessarily very creative. Um, on the other hand, I think that France and Paris in particular remain superior to the United States for reasons that have to do with culture. People like to talk about food, um, not just in terms of where they have been, but what they have made. The enthusiasm for food in America coincides with the continued decline of cooking at home. New York is the absolute capital of dining out and of low percentage of people who actually use their kitchen for anything other than, you know, storing stuff. <laughs> um, and I think that's not true in France. Now, it's not true in France in part because um, it's possible to shop on your way home. The car doesn't dominate. It's not still is suburbanized. One of the problems, you know, if you tell people you ought to cook at home more, you know, it's, it's much easier than you think, it's uh, much more healthful, it's spiritually enriching, it doesn't have to take a whole lot of time, but then you have to really be able to shop more than once a week or once every other week. And many people don't live in places where it's easy to pick something up on the way home. Uh, I mean, you know, something serious in the way that getting off the metro in most neighborhoods of Paris, you will find charcuteries, butchers, fish places, and so forth. As an historian, I th would like to relate to you an interesting aside that I experienced as a child. Uh, I grew up in a home that was uh, heavily infiltrated by gastronomy. My mother was a cookbook collector and also in the late 70s wrote a book that the New York Times judged as one of the 10 best of the year. It was called The Delectable Past. And it was a conversion of uh, recipes from around the world from as far south as the 1450s. Her name was Esther Oresti. And uh, one evening or one day, she was friendly with Craig Claiborne uh, he used to come down occasionally and spend the day cooking with her in our kitchen. Uh, I never witnessed it. I was ushered out of the house, or I may not have been living at home at that point. But I remember that the meal that emanated from the kitchen that was the most famous was what one might consider to be very mundane. It was a beautiful roast with roast vegetables and roast onions and roast potatoes. And it was thoroughly enjoyed by him. It was not anything fancy or French or Italian or anything else. Right, and I think that's very important um, to remember. But roasting is one thing that people don't do anymore. Uh, um, this, is, this is the Thanksgiving problem, right? Many people, many people only use their oven for Thanksgiving. And, you know, NPR has stopped just swatting away calls on, on sort of like, how do I turn my oven on? Or, or do I need to put this in a metal pan? Or, I, you know, uh, so yes, yes. I think, um, I think we are rediscovering certain aspects of food as pleasure and satisfaction, both creatively and, of course, most of all, sensually. But there are some things that we still don't do, uh, that people did routinely. Uh, in for better or worse in the 1950s and 1960s at a time when people dined out maybe 
20% of the time on average instead of 60% as it is now. I think we're uh, called to dinner. I hope you're hungry. Thank you.